Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to this uh, talk. This is Tom from the translation team. If you have feedback to the translators, tweet at C3Lingo or use the hashtag C3T or email us at hello at C3Lingo.org. So we have telematic infrastructure in Germany. We have the electronic health insurance card now, which has been introduced. And the reactions... So it saves... Uh, many different types of health data, like prescriptions, diagnosis, how much of this has actually been put into place, how the technology has evolved in the last years, if the big promises have been kept, that will be enlightened now by Christoph. He works at the um, University of Applied Sciences Münster and we'll talk about the last years here of technology. Welcome, Christoph. Thank you and welcome. Now at this late time, I want to talk about the telematic, telematic infrastructure. We had a smaller talk uh, uh, recently, but now we talk about the technical specifications. I want to create a small overview for you. And this can only be a small one, because if you look at this a specification, you can download this, actually, uh, at gematic.de. You will find a zip file, actually 97 zip files and 8,000 pages of PDFs, 1 to 2,000 uh, other pages and... This is only really a small overview, and I would please like to encourage you uh, to discuss about this, but also uh, an objective and fact-based discussion. And there are lots of reports recently, uh, especially in the last year, about the uh, telematic infrastructure. But as far as I know, not all of this has been very correct from the technical point of view. So there were some uh, half-truths going around, and I want to inform you today about this. So we begin. What, do, what are we talking about with telematic infrastructure? So here on the left side you can see the IT systems of the uh, health workers. This is the network of the practice. And many are connected, or at least they have connected systems, and the telematic infrastructure, or short TI, uh, there is the a card reader where you can put the health insurance card inside, but also other cards like the um, medical professional card and this connector uh, here. This connects the internal network with the central TI network. This is this other zone here. And there we find different things like uh, certificate authority and other central things like a time server, DNS server, directory server, like an LDAP server. And this is not a transparent network. It is uh, enclosed. And it is disconnected through some security measures. Uh, so not entirely connected. And there's also the provider zone where the um, manufacturers of uh, systems are hosting the products and um, specific services as well. And uh, on the very right side, you can only see the system, the data archive system, but there's also other networks, like the secure network of the KVK, which is uh, mandatory now if uh, you want to actually get paid as a doctor. And uh, you can only do that through this KVK network. This only works through a VPN connector, so they uh, usually have this at their practice now, sometimes for many years already. And uh, now we don't want different ones, but uh, we want actually one central one. And that's why we uh, all connect them to the telematic infrastructure, so we only need one from now on. Uh, now we look at the actors. Who does what? Where does the telematic infrastructure come from? And of course we have uh, the Ministry of Health. Jens Spahn is the current minister since May of this year. And uh, since then they are actually a uh, shareholder with more than 50% uh, of uh, Gematic. And at the same time, they uh, have put into law 
that uh, for decisions is only that it is only necessary to have a simple majority. This used to be different, where a consensus was consensus was necessary. But now uh, the Federal Health Office has the entire power to uh, push anything they want. Jens Spahn wanted um, to increase the speed, and this was the measure that he used for that. And Gematic here in the center, they specify the infrastructure itself, the services, the components, the uh, applications. They don't do this by themselves, but they do this in uh, connection with the uh, Federal Office for Security and Informa Information Technology, and they create different uh, guidelines there. And Gematic doesn't act alone, they do it together with them. But they don't actually produce any components, and they don't offer any services. This is all done by the private sector. Here we see the large systems, uh, large providers like T-Systems uh, and others, and they actually offer the services or create connectors, for example. And for that they need a certification for which they also need a certification from the uh, BSI. And But they don't actually test this themselves, but they have different evaluators, uh, like the German TÜV, but also others. And also interesting is that the providers can usually choose which evaluator they want, and they also pay those. So there is a little um, uh, conflict of interest, actually. Uh, between the uh, providers and the evaluators. And to combat this a little, the BSI actually audits the evaluators. And they also, of course, have to get certified to certify themselves. Now, let's go to the uh, applications that uh, are being used by doctors and patients, the so-called Fachanwendungen. I will call them FA from now on. And... Um, there is the uh, management of the patient data, uh, VSDM. Um, and for example, when I moved, uh, I had a new address, and now I told my health insurance company I uh, live somewhere else now, and uh, they told me, okay, you need this new card, they sent it to me, but this has uh, been changed now, and the uh, data on the card actually can be updated now. Uh, when I go to the doctor, uh, I put my card into the s machine, and uh, the connector will check my data, and um, if it is not up to date anymore, it will get actually updated on the card. And this is actually the only uh, actually um, working and right now in production uh, application of the telematic infrastructure. Okay, I want to look at an application and that's why I, I, I took the chance when I moved to try out what happens. I have a new address, I have a new card and I wanted to see how it works and, well, fail. Um, three days later I had the new card, so it doesn't, it's actually not in use, really. There is a reason, mainly because there are not enough uh, doctors who are attached to the network and about 120 of the uh, five-figure number of doctors is uh, attached to the network, therefore they cannot even update the card and it's not being utilized, which is a bit sad. Next year, maybe. Okay, so now we have this PII, Master Data Management. We have very critical information, for example, uh, certain KPIs for risk management, disease management programs. So we need, uh, there's a, a paramount need for s a critical security, but so my talk becomes a little more technical now. Uh, we're looking at the specification now. Uh, there's a lot that has to be, where, where they have to catch up with the state of the art. So on the very right, you have an insurer's server. It is attached to a central network. On the very left, you see the uh, insurer card. In the middle, you see a VPN connector a card terminal and uh, insurer's uh, VPN endpoint. And in order to have the connection uh, set up properly, you need a secure message system that is an ISO standard that is being applied here. 
It has symmetric encryption, it uses AES and a message encryption algorithm in order to have a secure and verified connection between the insurer and the card, and the data is only unencrypted on the card itself. So let's look at the second application. It's the communication of the uh, of the provider of the service. So between different uh, service providers like doctors, uh, psychotherapists, and pharmacists, uh, they have an LDAP system that has the addresses. It's uh, not in use yet. It's going to come next year. There are also registered email addresses of the doctors um, that are being encrypted with a, uh, with a certificate. So basically, they can encrypt the communication between the different service providers in order for it to be secure. If you compare this with PGP and SMIME, it works a little different. For example, you also want to uh, encrypt the subject and you want a certain level of encryption, so they thought they would do it a little differently and include the subject and use IS GCM. So if you remember, uh, PGP doesn't have GCM, they use something similar, but if you look, uh, if you look back a year, eFail was a big problem, or rather it still is, and um, this is not an issue here because they have a different kind of crypto. So on the left you see the client here, it can be Thunderbird or Outlook, or maybe even the, uh, the doctor's infrastructure system. They have the, the original message, and it's uh, being packaged into another message. The original message is being encapsulated, it's going to be encrypted and signed in the doctor's office. And this is being done in the connector. It's being sent to the email server by the doctor, and there is a real encryption between uh, the two connectors on both sides, the, uh, the doctor and the insur insurer's party. So let's go to the EPA, the, elect the digital uh, patient file. It's supposed to be the killer app in the TI. It's a voluntary uh, patient led, or the, the patient itself takes care of the file. And the patient has to go up to the doctor and say, Yeah, I want to have the EPA. Has to fill out a form, go to the doctor, uh, put his card into a device, and then uh, give them the credentials to do it. So um, they have to explicitly allow the doctor to create an EPA. It's also not being done that they created an empty file. It will, it will only happen if the, if the patient authorizes the doctor, and it it, the authorization is only for the specific doctor, not all of them. S the, doc uh, the, the patient can also read his or her own data. They can modify it, they can delete it. So, for example, if they have given uh, authentication for a psychotherapist and they're unhappy with the diagnosis or don't want anybody else to see it, they can delete it a year later, maybe. It also means that the doctor cannot rely on the fact that the uh, data is complete because the patient is always able to delete stuff. So, this is a bit problematic. Um, but they can at least have the possibility to sec securely save their data in a digital form. And it doesn't actually show up at the insurer side, and it's not being saved on the doctor's phone. So there's one problem with this. It has a, a lot of good. It has a good cryptography, but what happens if you lose the key? So uh, the the key is not. You can't export it from the card. So if the card is being lost, which happens quite frequently apparently, then the EPA is lost because the data would be lost, the file would be lost, they couldn't access it anywhere. So the question is how do they get around it? And their approach to this is they have a key backup. We heard from this about this two days ago. It's, it's basically being uploaded just like the EPA, which sounds dangerous at first. So what they did was they also uh, encrypt this key. This looks like this. You can look it up in the specification. It's actually quite readable. Um, they explain it quite nicely. So what happens is the client, for example, the, uh, the phone app um, connects via the key generation 
system and uh, encrypts the encryption key again with a master key. And the master key is being encrypted with two keys, the key one and the key two. One, twice because SGD1 and GCG2 are being securely distributed between two companies, different personnel. It's yeah, you want to uh, try to do secret sharing here, so not uh, that a single attacker from one of the organizations cannot un unencrypt the data. So what happens if you have an attacker without authorization? So back two days, you have two problems. Technically, you would need a key backup and the encrypted EPA. And then you would have to uh, break both SGD1 and SGD2 to get both keys. So they actually have put in a mechanism that even if you lose the key, they still can audit and do it. And there's also another problem, the app. Is, it's supposed it's to work in a way that you can uh, control everything, but it's being audited and certified, but not every update is certified by itself. Once it's certified once, they can basically push updates without recertifying every single update that they do. Obviously, they have to test it, but there's no independent party that verifies that the update is okay and doesn't actually add new security holes. So what does that look like in practice? If you remember 35C3, the patient file, it didn't look that well. So in practice, I'm, I'm not so sure how that's going to pan out. So in Münster, I also uh, help a small dental uh, practice. Uh, and uh, often things are unencrypted there and uh, pictures are sent via email, uh, unencrypted. And uh, since the GDPR has been introduced, there has been a lot of discussion, what can we do? Uh, some recommendations from the uh, um, groups of uh, dental doctors, but the usability is not good and Crypture has the problem that uh, some external server outside of the practice has the unencrypted data. And um, that is definitely uh, at least critical when it comes to the GDPR. And then some other recommendations. Uh, here is the handbook of Cryptfile. What should we do? We should, um, we should send one email, and um, then only in a separate email we should uh, send the password. But both are unencrypted. Or we should. Uh, what happens if I want to connect my practice? So I need this terminal. And then I look at the handbook, and then in one meter of this device, there has to be no camera, no microphone, not even a telephone. And the patient is uh, also supposed to put the pin into the device. So the patient even has to make sure that, for example, their smartphone is uh, more than one meter away. Um, and then it also, of course, cannot be too close to a wall, because there could be um, a device that could uh, deduct from electromagnetic um, radiation what is going on inside the device. And then I'm using the device and I found a secure place and before we start using it, so uh, I have to check the device every morning and then after um, the break, uh, lunch break, to make sure that uh, there has been no manipulation. It has three seals, which I also have to check each time. And then uh, I have the seal numbers on my list and I check them. Um, then I also open my drawer with my black UV light um, uh, lamp and um, then check all the uh, holograms there. And I asked around uh, between different doctors and nobody actually does this. So these are four pages, uh, common criteria and uh, that you have to keep in mind, but um, this is from the common criteria uh, protection profile, and this uh, means they are a potential victim with very high potential to become a victim. Uh, so that's why you also have to uh, think of things like the uh, electromagnetic radiation um, that I mentioned earlier. And there's the VPN connector, 
I also have to put that into my uh, doctor's office. And there has been a lot of discussion about this uh, connector. There's a serial part, so uh, between the uh, internal network and the internet, I put this uh, connector, and these lines indicate the secure connection, and the provider of the VPN offers me a secure internet connection, but this means all my traffic goes through this external provider, but uh, you should really think about whether you really want to do this. Another possibility would be a parallel uh, model for installation. So there is the normal connection to the internet, but there's also the VPN connector for the TI co uh, connections. They go through the connector, but the other traffic uh, goes straight from the office to the internet. And the connection of the connector actually is uh, usually done uh, by an external party um, that is uh, local. And over 90% of the practices are connected in the parallel mode. But these are not automatically insecure. Because if I already have a network which is on the internet anyway, even with a firewall, I thought about all the things. I have a secure email client, and I'm on the internet. And then I want to connect the connector. Then, personally, I would also do it with uh, the parallel model, because I don't want to route all my tra traffic through this third party. But the problem is, if my practice is not connected to the internet yet, and then there's this external um, service provider, and uh, he is paid by the, uh, uh, by the uh, action, so he doesn't want to do too much uh, work. So um, there he usually does the easiest thing to fulfill the minimum requirements. Uh, but what happens... Um, what, where does he get his information from? So, he has a uh, handbook, and he looks inside, and um, there it's written, okay, turn off TLS and authentication, because it only creates problems. That is uh, actually in the confidential uh, technician handbook. But if it's written there, you know, they will do it, probably. And there's the acoustic pin protection, and um, then it is recommended to talk to the doctor to decrease the volume of that. The doctor, of course, will say, I don't know what uh, this is about. Do whatever you want. This is pretty loud, so turn it off. And uh, in the handbook, it's written uh, only the maximum volume of 10 is actually allowed. So actually, I'm working against the specifications already. So now the TI in the public media or in public opinion. For example, on ZDF, the second German television network, there was a. Um, they talked about it, and there was a, a Trojan horse on the uh, practice network. And they showed that if this is the case, then I can actually intercept the data of uh, the electronic health. Rec uh, electronic health insurance card. But um, the relevancy of the other protection mechanisms is questionable once you have a Trojan on your um, system because the Trojan could just read the unencrypted data anyway that uh, you have stored, so you don't need access to the telematic infrastructure. So we should really discuss this because this is a big problem. And we really should change this to be more correctly implemented. Other, thing, other connection infrastructure projects, they have, they're actually currently suing the telematic infrastructure because it is insecure. And they are actually explicitly against the centralization of data storage. So they actually want to decentralize this uh, at the different providers and this is voluntary and uh, personally of course I would also wish for something that I can do voluntarily and save it uh, decentralized on a voluntary basis but um, they who actually criticize the centralization of data storage actually also save the data centrally so this is a little bit uh, inconsistent, because if you criticize this, you shouldn't be doing it yourself, right? 
but uh, maybe they're doing it because of other reasons that are unknown. So my conclusion about the telematic infrastructure. So we have to really increase the detail and uh, quality of the specification. It can't be that some technician just drives there, plugs something in, and then it is uh, supposedly working. We really have to make sure that uh, we improve this. And we have we had the chance to increase the security level of all German doctors' offices, but uh, we missed that chance um, to make it mandatory. And the uh, actual um, tutorials for the staff were sometimes even more like a sales pitch than an actual educational program. And we have to include the doctors more in the creation of the specification. So if you look at the requirements of the handbook and then look at reality, they are not compatible. So we have to ask doctors what they think of this. And if we can convince the doctors, then perhaps we can also reach the patients. We also, I'm also wishing for more transparency. So the report they do on security, it is pretty slim. Effectively, only six pages uh, which say everything is secure, don't worry. So, for example, I would love to see the pen test results, they could be published. I would like to see that. So finally, e-health, we won't be able to stop it. It will become more digital. Nobody wants to send analog x-ray pictures, or at least it would be easier if this was digital. But I also make, want to make sure, I don't want to stop it in every single uh, aspect of uh, health, but we have to make sure that we evaluate correctly where it is a valuable addition. And we should look at all the different components and make sure that they are as secure as possible. And with this, I want to thank you. You've been listening to uh, Tom and Kaste for the translation of the talk. E-health. Uh, we would be very grateful for any feedback via Twitter using the hashtag at C3UT. Until next time, thank you very much for listening. We're now going to go to the Q&A. Are there any things with the TI? Some mode of lawful interception. So can... Uh, uh, can the government actually ask them to provide data? I'm always only talking about the current specification, and obviously laws and specifications can change. But currently, this is not the case. I'm, I'm thinking about the uh, EPA. Uh, only the patient is allowed to authorize and access that uh, data. And the key is not exportable in order... Uh, it's only exportable for a backup, but that's about it. The key export is also uh, tied to the secret sharing scheme. So this there, it's not specified in a way that lawful interception is possible. What isn't really clear to me is want the doctor first collect all the data into their internal system and what if um, the, the doctor is not allowed to look at it and he's not allowed to copy it but obviously you have to make sure that uh, if you if, if you give them access they can also copy it you cannot prevent them from making a copy they can, if if the data is wrong, they actually have to correct it, and they can copy it. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the talk. One question about the VPN appliances, which are now in every doctor's office. Well, what about backups and configuration updates and firmware updates? Uh, recently, there was a case at the telecom 
where a few parts were overlooked. Is there any specification for updates? Is it centralized from the TI or is it locally done by the service providers? The updates for the reader and the connector are being pushed centrally. It's not mandatory. They, they cannot actually push it, uh, neither the Gematic nor the, uh, the ops team. The doctor has to authorize this, and depending on the kind of contract they have for the update. They can also download it themselves from the, uh, from the web surf, uh, interface of the connector. And for the updates, it's uh, the case that they actually have to be certified. A question from the internet. Looking at the IT know-how and the demographic situation, what is the expected usage in percent of the electronic health record? Good question. Um, I'd rather assume that it's the younger folks that are using it. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I can only have a guesstimate. There are no numbers publicly available. There are only pre-test studies that were done in advance, but I don't know the numbers, sorry. Thank you for the talk. What about if I say I actually write my own health file app or there is an open source program and I compile it myself and I host it myself? Can I do this? Can I certify myself somehow to be eligible? Uh, no, that's not something that was provided for. You would need a central authorization through the GSI and the Gematic, and you need access to the system. You don't get that without the certification, and you have to walk up to the Gematic who are going to verify you against all sorts of dependencies and uh, uh, requests that they have. And it's not actually considered valid then to use open source software in this case. So there was a slide about better crypto for email. Who can can use this and can how can I use this with my doctor? Currently, this is not something they had in mind for the patient, only for the service provider. For example, the, uh, the, the doctors can exchange um, mails and doctor's letters, um, especially for the x-rays. It's a very common scenario. So they can communicate among themselves. It's not, they didn't have it in mind to use it for the patients. I would think this is a good idea, but they didn't think about it when they specified it. I have two questions. First one, if I understood correctly, this is not for everyone, but for the uh, publicly insured. So is it possible to be insured there, if, uh, to store your data there if you're privately insured? Second question, what happens if we accidentally swap cards, so somebody falls down, they have dementia, but they have the wrong card, they're connected now, but the data gets mixed there. How can we solve this? As for your first question, the private insurers uh, basically stopped uh, participating in the Project 2009. Currently, there are attempts to think about it at least to get on board again for them. They're evaluating how it's working. They're not, uh, they didn't have them in mind when doing the specification. It's technically feasible, of course, but if it's going to come, well, we don't know. We're going to see. For the second question, yeah, if the card is uh, identified or is, is used for the wrong person, and if, you, if it's attached to the wrong file in the computer for the wrong patient, then obviously you're going to have a, a mix-up and you're going to have a bit of a mess in the data. And you can possibly, well, get the data from someone else. There's no way to check if it actually matches. Can I take it back? Uh, yeah, as a patient, I can definitely delete it. 
okay. Well, there's a, a, a stand-in if you're not capable of doing it, but the patient first has to give them the authorization. So, f for example, the, the doctor is allowed to uh, access the data, and there is a stand-in rule. That basically, you're saying, okay, I want my daughter to take care of this for me, and I'm not so sure if the doctor is allowed to delete the, the, their own data, the one that they created for the patient. We have five minutes left. Six people at microphones. Please shorten your questions. Thank you for the talk. I want to motivate why you should look at this uh, continuously from now on. Fifteen years ago, when I was um, working in this field as a consultant, um, it is clear now, today we have to do everything analog still. But isn't this really a dead horse which is just uh, eating up billions? So do you think this will actually become something useful or is it just going to rot? Yeah, well, it's depending on uh, the estimation, but it's between one and a half and three billion. Um, it it kind of depends on who you, the kind of requirements that they put out and for the different governing bodies at the Gematic under Dr. Rössler, an older minister of health. Uh, was he had different ideas in mind and they stopped it and then they had to start it again which took time and money and the current communication is sort of already the future basically the the communication between patients is something I as a data protection officer I really look forward to because it provides a lot of additional security for the data and I think it's a lot better if the patients actually have a look at the data that there is being saved for them if you go to the doctor and it's sometimes tricky or it used to be tricky to get the data that the doctor has on file for you I'm not sure if EPA is the best way. For example, decentral storage would also be nice. But the important part is that something moves and that something something changes towards the better. And it's it looks like it's starting now to get better. And we definitely need to work on it. But it still it looks like we're on a good path. So data is actually encrypted with private providers. But for how many years is this crypto actually going to be considered to be good? How can we ensure that the data encrypted today can't be easily decrypted in the future? Well, obviously there's no 100% security for this. They're using AES-256 and you can speculate if it's going to be broken one day, but uh, EPA should be a lifelong file. So... They're basically banking. Oh, they they actually have a method for re-encrypting it every now and then, built into the specification. And you could change the encryption along the way. So if you realize at some point that there is an attack on AES, then you could re-key it to a different uh, uh, encryption algorithm. For example, this is being done right now because they're going to ECC, so elliptic curves. So if there's a breakthrough for AES, then your data would suddenly be um, readable. So if if there is a new attack, definitely it would be readable. The doctor is responsible for the data that are created uh, in his uh, practice. How can I trust the system that it is actually secure. Uh, legally speaking, I'm not a lawyer, of course, but and the, the patient has to give access and the doctor can say that the patient did uh, uh, the access permission or they gave permission to access it. So he doesn't have any way to legally... Uh, Say, secure his position. He can only look at the specification, the, which is, well, questionable. He, he cannot really check it, what, where the data is going, so he, they can only uh, put in the data and then upload it. But obviously, he 
he or she cannot personally audit what is happening to the data after that fact because he's not running the system. But Thank you for the talk and for showing us the errors in the ZDF coverage. I have a question about the technician's handbook. Um, where, for example, it's uh, written that TLS should be turned off. Who made this handbook? There are probably different variants, but who wrote this and who's being critiqued here? One of many, yeah, different, uh, different manuals, different uh, tutors. Yeah. So this concludes this talk and Q and A. Unfortunately, not everybody could ask the questions. But thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for coming here. And we now say goodbye to Christoph with a warm round of applause.